Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to focus on the structure and functions of proteins. Proteins are another class of macromolecules. They are true polymers in that they are made up of amino acids hooked together, uh, first of all, in chains. Uh, proteins are probably the most diverse group of macromolecules uh, found in biology. Uh, protein structure is pretty complex. It has multiple levels. We're going to look at each one. And finally, proteins have many, many, many different functions in living cells of all types, plants, fungi, bacteria, animal. Enzymes are probably the most familiar proteins to most of you. Um, remember, enzymes act as biological catalysts, which means that, that they speed up chemical reactions. That's an important under, uh, word to understand here. Uh, catalysts are any type of chemical that causes a chemical reaction to happen faster. And in living cells, this role is performed by a class of proteins called enzymes. Proteins also play major roles in defense, storage, transport, communication, movement, structural support. The list goes on and on. We're going to look at those in more detail in a few minutes. First of all, let's look at the structure of proteins. Uh, as I said earlier, proteins are polymers of amino acids, which means that you build proteins by hooking together amino acids. So we have amino acid here, and we're going to hook it to another amino acid, and so on. And we're going to build these chains that can go on and on and on for thousands of amino acids. Uh, there are 20 different amino acids used by life on Earth. Uh, this is a pretty small list compared to the possible amino acids out there, but there are 20 that we do use and they get transcribed and translated in protein synthesis. Uh, amino acids are held together by a new type of linkage called a peptide bond. Okay, this peptide bond is formed by a dehydration synthesis just like we saw in carbohydrates and lipids. So let's review what an amino acid looks like. Remember, amino acids contain nitrogen, bonded to a carbon, bonded to a carbon. So this is the basic backbone of an amino acid. Now, amino acids in the center here, well, we're going to save that for last. Over here, we have the amine group, which, if you remember, was a nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens. And over here, we have our carboxyl group, which looks like this. So that's the basic structure for, amino, for an amino acid. Now we've got to put a hydrogen on here, and then this final covalent bond here, we're going to hook something. It could be a whole bunch of different things. If you just put a hydrogen here, this becomes the amino acid glycine, which I think we saw earlier. It's the simplest amino acid out there. But you can also hook many, many different things here. So in general, these are called side chains. So one of the ways, the way that you make the 20 different amino acids that I referenced over here is that you just change this, what goes right here, what gets hooked right here. So you can hook any number of different things onto here to make 20 different amino acids. And they all have slightly different properties, of course. Okay, proteins have four levels of structure. Uh, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and some proteins exhibit a fourth level of structure called the quaternary level. Uh, we're going to look at each one of these in detail. The primary structure of all proteins is just the sequence of amino acids, the order in which they are hooked together. And in this part of the diagram, we're showing the primary structure of the protein. Another name for a protein when it's in this form is a polypeptide many peptide bonds holding this together. This sequence is determined by the DNA code. It's what you inherit. It's in your DNA. And as I said earlier, each amino acid is held together by special bonds called peptide bonds. Okay, the secondary level of structure is what happens to the primary structure next. And two, this can go two different ways. Well, actually three different ways. The first way is the amino acid chain or the polypeptide can get coiled up into a spring-like structure called an alpha helix. Or this amino acid sequence can get folded back and forth and back and forth into something that looks like a pleated sheet. And that's called the beta pleated sheet formation. And this spiraling or helix formation or pleating formation is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. So if you imagine all these little hydrogen bond attractions here between all the OH groups and H groups and side chains are what hold this together. And the same thing is going on in here. 
Okay, the tertiary level of structure is the three-dimensional folding represented here in this part of the diagram of the pleated sheets and the alpha helices and the parts of the primary structure that didn't pleat or get spiraled up. And you get this very complex three-dimensional structure here that is the, the classic 3D tertiary structure of proteins. Now, this is reinforced by disulfide bridges. We're going to talk about, I'll show you those in a future slide. But what's kind of cool is the hydrophobic side chains tend to get pushed towards the middle of the protein, and the hydrophilic side chains of all the amino acids get pushed to the outside. So we get this formation, this tertiary three-dimensional formation of the protein being influenced by the, the watery environment that it's being made in, of course, because um, cytoplasm is mostly water. Okay, the quaternary structure is when you take multiple folded proteins and you combine them into like a super protein. And we call this an aggregation. And some proteins actually exhibit this. Um, some very familiar ones we're going to look at in a couple slides. All right, back to that idea of a disulfide bridge. If you remember the amino acid cystine, we saw in an earlier video cast, cystine or cysteine contains sulfur, uh, a sulfhydryl group. So here we have a cystine over here, and we have a cystine over here. Um, each of these are part of a chain of amino acids that have been folded so that they come in close to each other. And what happens is these two um, sulfhydryl groups can form a, a cross bond or a cross link. And here you see it down here. And this is called a disulfide bridge. Di meaning two, and sulfides referring to the sulfhydryl groups. And this is a pretty strong bond. It uh, stabilizes the tertiary structure of many proteins. Uh, proteins that have more cysteines or cystines in them have more disulfide bridges, so they tend to be uh, tougher proteins, at least in their tertiary structure. Okay, here's a really cool picture of a hemoglobin molecule. Uh, hemoglobin has a, ter a um, tertiary and quaternary structure. Uh, they've color-coded them here for you. Uh, we've got this green, this blue, and this kind of teal color, and this kind of orange color down here. These are four different proteins that have combined to make a single hemoglobin molecule. And if you look in here, this stuff here, and there's one back here and one here. These are called heme groups. They're centered around iron atoms. You probably remember that blood contains a lot of iron. And actually the name heme comes from um, um, the word that means blood. And hemoglobin contains four heme groups. Um, the proteins around the heme groups kind of form little cages. So all this folding and all this, this structure here has to do with the function of hemoglobin, which is to carry oxygen in your blood. Now, structure is very closely associated with function in proteins. The, the shape or the structure of a protein determines its function. And anything you do to change the shape of a protein may alter, destroy, or completely change the function of that protein. Uh, many things can change the shape of protein molecules. Things like heat, changes in pH, changes in salt concentration, all these things can change the shape of a protein. And everybody has seen this, uh, whether you realize it or not, um, if you've ever cooked an egg, um, egg is made up of primarily a type of protein called albumin. It's the main ingredient in the white part of an egg. And if you expose albumin to heat, its, it's primary, secondary, and tertiary structures all get changed, especially the secondary structures. And this is irreversible, so you can't uncook an egg. So albumin, its structure changes, that changes its physical characteristics, it goes from clear and runny to semi-solid and white, and you can't reverse this. So heat is probably the easiest um, way to change a protein. We have a word for this, when you heat proteins or expose them to strong acids, or do anything that, that, that destroys their function, we call this denaturization. Denaturization. Okay, so you can denature proteins by heating them, exposing them to acids, and so on. We're going to use this to stop protein structures in some labs we're going to do. An example of a change to primary structure, changing the function of a protein, is what happens in sickle cell anemia. Uh, sickle cell disease is, is an inherited blood disease that's caused when a normal gene is mutated and this gene is coding for the hemoglobin protein. So if you change the primary sequence of the amino acids, then you're going to be changing the function of 
the hemoglobin gene, the hemoglobin protein. And when the hemoglobin protein structure is changed, it no longer functions properly. And this is what causes sickle cell disease. And what's kind of cool about this um, is it's a single mutation. It's what we call a point mutation. It's a change of a single amino acid in the genetic code. Let me show you what I mean here. Um, here's a normal cell. Okay, and this normal cell has this sequence of DNA triplets, CAA, GTA, AAC, and so on. These get transcribed to messenger RNA, if you remember that. Um, here's the messenger RNA sequence. And of course, the messenger RNA sequence gets translated into a sequence of amino acids. And the normal cell sequence, and the hemoglobin gene, I, rem I think, is you know, 120 or 160 amino acids long. So this is just one short little part of it. But the normal gene goes valine, histine, leucine, threonine, proline, um, glutamine, glutamine. And in sickle cell disease, which is the abnormal form, if you look at the code here, okay, you can see the single mutation right here. Here we have a thymine in the DNA is replaced by an adenine. Adenine codes for uracil, the GUA codon, codes for valine, not glutamine like it's supposed to be. So we end up with valine, a mistake, an inappropriate placement of valine here in the amino acid chain. And this single, cha single cha change to the primary structure of the protein causes what we call sickle cell disease. All right, proteins get folded up in three-dimensional space. Uh, this is often assisted by other proteins called chaperonin proteins. I always thought that was um, scientists have a little bit of fun naming these. So these proteins, these polypeptides, get chaperoned into forming the right shape. So here's your polypeptide chain here, represented in uh, kind of a dark blue. This is the chaperonin protein, represented by this green um, can-like structure. Uh, again, this is highly symbolic, but I'm trying to show you what happens here. The polypeptide goes into the chaperonin protein, it gets folded up properly, and then dumped back out. So the function of chaperonin proteins is to oversee the three-dimensional folding or the tertiary structure of other polypeptides, which I think is kind of cool. Okay, this table here is a very quick summary of the diversity of functions that proteins have. Uh, proteins function as enzymes, for example, sucrase. We've already talked about sucrase. Sucrase is the enzyme that breaks um, sucrose up into glucose and fructose. Uh, many Proteins also function as storage molecules like casein. Casein is the protein in milk. If you take up some milk and heat it up in a pan, you'll see it'll form that skin on the top. That's the casein being denatured and forming that um, pretty tough skin on the top. Uh, there are hormone proteins like insulin, which helps regulate our blood sugar. There are proteins that, that allow mu muscles to contract by interacting with each other. The two most common of these are actin and myosin. There are proteins that function in defense. You've probably heard of antibodies. There are proteins that function in transport. We just talked about hemoglobin and its role in transporting oxygen in the blood. There are proteins that function in communication. These are the embedded proteins in cell membranes that can receive signals and interact with other um, cell components. And finally, there are proteins that function in support or structural proteins. Uh, keratin is the main ingredient in your hair. It's tough, waterproof, flexible, makes hair, fingernails, feathers, claws, uh, fish scales. All these things are keratin. And then there's collagen. Collagen forms a network or kind of a scaffolding system in your skin so that your skin cells have something to grab onto. It gives your skin its flexibility and its bounciness. Um, as we age, unfortunately, our skin cells stop making collagen as well as they did when we were younger, causing us to wrinkle. So I'm hoping you've got a pretty good idea of the structure and function of proteins, and we will stop there.